All right, so now we're on to software testing part two. This is the part where we address the question, um, if your software's current functionality has been documented and you have some initial tests written, um, where do you go from there? How do you improve your testing situation to the point where it's considered dumb? Let's think about this problem as selecting the right tests. Taking a step back, there are two levels of tests, um, regression testing and continuous integration type tests. And there are multiple granularities of tests from unit tests all the way up to integration tests, which look at things at a very large level. Computer scientists tend to gravitate towards tests that run quickly and check data structures, types, definitions, syntax, and error reporting. These quick tests are great for a continuous integration suite. Domain scientists tend to think of ways to compare the program outputs to external measures like known solutions and example run cases. Those kinds of tests can be long running and need interpretation to understand what's going on sometimes. Such tests are often better suited for regression testing, which can be set up separately to run on a dedicated server or on a nightly or weekly schedule. Since testing is so broad, individual tests can vary in complexity. As a rule of thumb, complicated tests are, um, are anti-patterns. Tests should be as simple as possible and always provide information on what went wrong. If a test can't help to diagnose an error condition, it's not a very useful test. You might be tempted to get overly creative with, te with test cases or turn every possible scenario into a test. This can also be counterproductive. Time spent on creating, maintaining, and er interpreting tests takes team resources. Ideally, tests are closely aligned with the science objective. Then the tests themselves provide baselines and are motivating uh, to create and to maintain. If testing goes too far away from that, it can distract the project away from achieving its next great features. On the other hand, if there's not enough testing, then defects in the code can slip through. For example, users might assume the overlap region between processors is communicated correctly during a halo exchange. Uh, a halo exchange, if you, if you don't know about this idea, uh, is illustrated over here, where two different um, MPI ranks have red cells that they're responsible for updating, and then they have outside cells, what are called halo cells, um, which are not directly updated by them, so they have to um, pull their value over the network at every time step. And if you want a really large halo, you might encounter topology issues and things. So it's incorrect to assume that a halo exchange will work for any size of, of uh, domain buffer. Um, you really need a test for that. If there's no test that tries that out with every with varying halo size, there's no way to know when that assumption actually breaks down. This line of thought leads to the idea of a team meeting, focused specifically on creating a testing plan. The goal of such a meeting is to clearly map out the expected uses of the code. What parts of the code are critical to long-term stability? Who on your team should be responsible for ensuring that each piece works? Are there additional difficulties coming from interactive modules? How can these be reasonably addressed with example use cases? Okay, so now everybody's on board with your testing plan and your code is in a good place. What happens next? You can double check your work using a code coverage tool. You uh, can create a policy on what to do with failed tests and issues that are, that are coming in marked as bugs. It helps to assign responsibility for the test suite, both so that things happen and also so that you can recognize the hard work that's put in by that team member who's who's faced with dealing with all of these, uh, tracking down all of the bugs and, and issues with regressing testing. You should consider your testing suite during refactorings and use it to, um, to kind of check the code process uh, in code releases. Cost effectiveness comes in here because if you already have defined functionalities and tests that go with those functionalities, then it's much less likely that your team will get sidetracked later by having to maintain bug fixes. Um, for past releases. That's a rabbit hole that nobody wants to go down. With those general guidelines in mind, let's get down to some specific examples uh, from the collected experiences of our team members. I think all of these examples come from uh, Anshu Dubey's work with the E3SM and flash codes. So thanks Anshu, uh, and hopefully I don't misrepresent these. Um, example one is an ideal case. You're developing a new code and develop your diagnostics as you're developing the code itself. Taking the extra time to harden those diagnostics into a real test suite will save you headaches later. You likely have a lot of comparisons against known expected solutions. You should try and make things as granular as possible though, 
Uh, the scaffolding idea discussed next finds a way to build up a program testing each new piece. Remember to inject error cases into your tests so that you know your code will discover erroneous input correctly. As the package gets more complex, it's non-trivial to devise good tests. Nevertheless, good tests are extremely important. Here's an example from the E3SM code, the Exascale Earth System model. Although advanced now, it originated from a combination of Fortran codes dealing with various aspects of climate modeling. As a combination of many modules, it was difficult to create an overall testing strategy. So um, shown on the tree on the right is kind of an overall schematic of the way that modules in the code can link together um, and import different parts of each module. What's happening here is that um, to build a testing strategy, looks like this might be going a little bit too fast for me. Um, so as this bottom right piece is moved out, we're thinking about trying to build a test for it. Um, and to, to isolate a small section of the code and build a testing strategy for it, um, we first want to you know, think about what's the, the section that we want to start developing strategies for, and then ask what kind of state comes in that, um, that is needed to run the test. So here is kind of a, a bubble of the captured state. In the E3SM model, um, there's an entire climate model that runs, and there's a state that's the, you know, the, the state of all of the, um, the Earth systems that has to be fed into this little piece of code in order to test if the, the piece of code does its thing on the, uh, the incoming state correctly. So if you capture and save that state, you can rerun it, um, rerun the test and only exercise the part of the code that you want. Sometimes it's not that straight. Um, oh, and then you want a driver for it. Um, the driver, of course, will read the state in, feed it to the code, and then check that the uh, code is doing what it's supposed to. Sometimes it's not that simple, though, um, because as codes develop, they start to pull in pieces from other modules. This red line is showing a dependency that comes in as a simple import um, that's relatively isolated because this piece of code was, um, was modular. This red dot is showing a dependency of a module load from this, um, from this code down here. Um, and this dependency is harder to isolate. So what had to happen in this case is that the red dot had to be um, rewritten so that it had fewer imports from the rest of the code to make the test as modular as possible. Finally, the driver will um, read from the state, uh, execute, exercise the code that it wants to exercise and make sure that um, the results are, are passing all of its tests. In this particular example, doing this process was really helpful because it took the original testing process from something that required um, hours to run on a supercomputer to something that ran in 20 seconds on a developer's laptop. As a next example, um, I'll talk about structuring tests to pinpoint uh, bugs. These examples come from the flash code, which simulates particles and fields in astrophysics, like exploding stars. Here, the unit testing framework was developed as a series of layers. They build up from basic to advanced functionality. For example, the grid cell can be tested by creating fake functions to put onto the grid and verifying their behavior. What I'm showing with these circles are, are unit tests that have um, some dependencies that are real and some dependencies that are mocked up. So here's a unit test that doesn't have dependencies. Here's a unit test where some dependencies had to be mocked up and some dependencies were, were imported from something that had been previously tested. Um, in, you can think about, um, for this example, uh, functions that get put onto the grid usually come from a physical model. But of course, it's easy to also construct uh, mocked up functions that are simple linear functions or, or some known analytical functions. Um, and those are, those are pieces that you put into your uh, tests that are mocked up, but serve to let you uh, check that the grid cells are working correctly without any dependencies from other pieces of the code. The scaffolding approach means that you can test each new piece as it's added, um, and it lets you kind of separate concerns to understand what's going on. Here's another example um, of structured testing. This one ver helps, um, see, it's, it's an example of how the halo exchange was verified on a cell grid. The test initializes the interior cells with the known function, then does the halo exchange. Um, where this halo is exchanged between processors, and it can then check whether the guard cell, the blue region, has been properly copied over from the neighbors. Similarly, a unit test can be written to verify other parts of the computation, uh, like computing the energy from the pressure and the temperature. So there, there are lots of other unit tests going on at the same time. Eventually, all those unit tests build together 
to make something that's a high level test. Um, here, this is a, a unit test for hydrodynamics from the set of blast wave. Here, the set of blast wave is uh, simulated using a grid and the equation of state that are previously tested. The set of wave has a known analytical solution, which provides an error estimate for the implementation. Out of tolerance errors at this stage indicate a problem specific to the hydrodynamics since the cells and equation of state were already tested. In addition, plotting errors versus space and time helps to train graduate students. Uh, these dots are showing that the other two areas were previously tested and a hydro test is now what's being um, tested with real dependencies. This test can be developed farther too. Changing out the uniform grid for an adaptive mesh or turning on options for regridding should reduce the errors. Um, if this is not the case, then there's a way to quickly pinpoint the underlying cause. For example, once you know the setup blast wave test is working correctly on a uniform grid, um, if, you now, if you now run the, the, uh, the hydro code and, and test this blast wave without adaptive uh, mesh, oh, so, so this is the first test that makes sure that the hydro is working. But now if hydro is working, but adaptive mesh causes it to fail, you know that the thing came from, um, you know that the, the errors came from the adaptive meshing. And if, you, if adaptive meshing is working and you turn on dynamic refinement of that adaptive meshing and it now fails, you know that the error came from dynamic refinement, which moves the grid cell backwards in the gridding. So by, by stepwise building up of, of tests based on things that are already working, um, you can have a, a set of tests which lets you pinpoint the errors. This final example shows a way to map your code for testing. The x-axis in this, uh, this table here is showing different kinds of physics that are simulated by the flash code. And the y-axis uh, vertically is showing different modules in the code, adaptive mesh refinement or uniform grid, multi-grid methods or Fourier transforms. Um, the way that this kind of map works is that you can list out all of your unit tests and example applications. So you can follow you know, from simple tests to complex, to complex tests um, and for every test, you give it a, a simple code so that you don't overwhelm the size of your grid. It makes it easy to map. Um, so there's a test called CL. The CL test exercises uh, hydro EOS, burn, and particles physics, and it exercises those inside the AMR module. When you continue this process, you can put all of the tests onto the grid and you can have this map. It's like the code coverage map that you would see from uh, a code coverage tool, but it's relevant to the domain scientists who will look at your code and say, well, what if I want to simulate um, a uniform grid and, and gravity? Uh, you could directly show them this picture and they would realize that that's not a tested case. On the other hand, not every grid cell needs to be covered because um, it may not be necessary physically to simulate uh, a gravity model of a uniform grid. Right? So this picture is, is useful uh, for organizing your tests and helps you speak to the domain scientists. I'm going to end um, this testing section with some takeaways. Testing requires a thoughtful plan that works in the context of your project. You should pick out tests for their ability to quickly pinpoint the source of potential errors. That includes both unit test level and integration test levels. It also includes tests that run as quick correctness checks and longer running regression testing. Finally, testing is part of a holistic validation strategy for your code. As you iterate on the science problem, the importance of features changes, and the implementations can move around a lot, um, as we saw in Andrew's talk. The time and effort spent testing should move your project forward by providing stability where it's most critically needed. With that, I will conclude and take questions.